As I mentioned earlier, we have special guests in the house today. We have Chris Zinni and Paul Sophia Anderson, all the way from the Dominican Republic via Cloquet, okay, via, I think you may have stopped at you before you made Cloquet, okay, if I'm not mistaken, as well on the East Coast, not there in Florida. And uh, they'll tell you all about their stuff. I'll just give you a quick background with them because uh, my family, or particularly my wife, we've known them for a very long time. My, my wife worked with Chris at the Science Museum of Iowa a lifetime ago. <laughs> and uh, she went to college at Drake with Sydney. And so she's known them for a very long time. I didn't, of course, get to know them like I told my wife, but I've known Chris and Sydney now for 16, 17 years, something in that neighborhood. And uh, we, we supported them in our last church, and, and uh, it was really cool because I didn't know this way back when I didn't know them. Cindy kind of grew up in some new pod, you know, southern Minnesota. Chris was in the Cloquet area. So, so it was convenient when we were in Osika, because, you know, not, not, they weren't too far away from one of their stomping grounds. Then we moved to Aiken. Well, eh, it's kind of convenient again, because Chris is from Cloquet. Cloquet, so uh, it, it works out. Anywhere else you guys live that we need to move to? That we should move? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll move to the DR. That, that might be a little while yet, however. Um, <laughs> but not a bad place to live. Uh, they, have, they have a tremendous compound. A wonderful place. Their facility is incredible. We went, um, we left December 28th, right before COVID hit in March. And so we were there from December 28th until January 4th, I think, was when we came back. And that was our service window. We went to the DR. Um, our, our primary task was we built some benches. Uh, Time Ministries, at least in the DR specifically, they build churches on site, they're modular buildings, and, and so the, the local church will have a, a spot, they, they do the foundation with cinder blocks and all that prep work gets done ahead of time, and then they come in with literally a church on a truck, and, and they build this church. And they give the church away for free. These, these are often churches who can never afford a facility of their own. So people like you and me and churches like ours support that work, and we go, there's a fee for it, and our church sends money to support that. And, and so these churches, and they play on it's in the many hundreds now that they've done, both in the DR and some in the media as well. And they go out and they build these churches in conjunction with the people who are there serving. They put up these church buildings, but that's all there is, is a building. And then they need somebody to help fill that. That's where we came in in our, our work. We built some benches. And we got to bring those benches out. And uh, in fact, just this last week, I think it might be coincidence, maybe it was intentional, they posted a video on the Time Facebook page of the church with the pastor where we brought our specific benches to. And we got to see how the ministry is, is moving along. And now, a couple of years later, since we've been here, a month, year, 18 months, 19 months, whatever it's been, 21 months, I guess. Uh, so, so that was really cool. And, and, and it's a neat chance for us to have Chris and Cindy in. We're excited because, as I mentioned earlier, we're bringing them on as supported missionaries. And so we will be directly supporting them as a church for the years to come. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And we look forward to a long lasting partnership with them. As many of you know, many of our ministries that we've supported, we've supported for a very, very long time. And, uh, and so those opportunities don't come that frequently. So it was really cool that it just timed out perfectly that they were about to come and we were about to take them on and have them be able to come and share with us once again. They're always interesting, always always wonderful to hear from. So with that, I'm going to invite Chris and Cindy up. we got mics here for each one of you. You can pick whichever one you want, uh, the two of you. And I'm going to get out of the way. And as I said, we have lunch after church, and you can visit with them in the lobby as well. Anywhere else. So with that, thank you for coming. Good to see you. Good to see you. Paul? Good to see you. You can also call Paul Paolo. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, well, uh, as Chris mentioned, we are the Anderson family. Uh, my name is Chris, and this is my wife, Cindy, and we also have... My name is Paul. And how old are you? Eight and a half. I'm going to be nine in January 5th. <laughs> Just so you know. And this is... And oh, when is your birthday? Do you remember? January 11th. January 11th. So it's a, uh, a busy time of year between Christmas and New Year's. Fortunately, we're here because then they also have Three Kings Day in the Dominican Republic, and so there's more presents involved. So thank you very much, guys. You can go and sit down. 
Yes, um, Chris, I think you pretty much gave our presentation. I mean, that's the whole works there. So let's go, let's go eat early. Uh, I guess I should ask, first of all, are uh, Vikings playing today? Yes. Is that an early game or late game? Early. Early. Oh, okay, so I better cancel the, the uh, sermon out of the book of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yes, we uh, we are privileged to be here today, and I always just love this this view. There's still a few leaves on the trees uh, out there, as much as, as you may think uh, it would be great to see palm trees. Uh, there are times when when seeing these beautiful this beautiful fall season and the colors changing is, is such a privilege. So it's great that we made it while there were still still a few a few leaves on the trees. All right. So let's see if this thing works. Let's see. You. Well, it would help if I would, like, and you need to point it up there. We're going to need to point it up there. All right. Are you sure you want this for a slide? Yes, we want. Oh, no, no. We do want that for a slide. Absolutely. That was our intro slide. Um, they did not ride out, out to the chapel in that. <laughs> so, yes, we, we represent Time Ministries in the, in the Dominican Republic. We are the Anderson family. And we have had the pleasure of serving there since 2010. It's probably a little bit too small to read, maybe. Um, been there since 2010, so we're going on 11 years serving the Lord in that location. Although uh, my wife Cindy was a summer intern way back in 1996, and uh, we made trips there in 97 and 2003. So this ministry, Time Ministries, has had a long history uh, in, our, in our lives. So. One of the questions we get asked then is, was our connection to Lord Baptist? Chris already mentioned that. Cindy went to, to school with Kim, and um, and then we had uh, had relatives in uh, in Wasika as well when when they were serving serving there, and uh, and now up here. I'm originally from Cloquet, and so yes, it's neat to have this this kind of family family connection to a, to a local church. So the first question is is you know, what's our connection? The next one is usually, where's the Dominican Republic? And we always like to show this slide because it's not always talked about uh, in the news. But uh, our neighboring country has been in the news quite a bit lately. It's on the same island as Haiti. They're on the west side, and we are on the east side. So it's a, a short two-hour flight from Miami, a little bit longer from, from Aiken, but uh, <laughs> still reasonably easy, uh, easy to, uh, to get to. Uh, Time has two main ministry locations, uh, the Dominican Republic and also in Monterey, Mexico. That was the first uh, location where Time Ministries was founded. And then our home office is just uh, just south in Dubai. Uh, Time has... So the purpose of Time Ministries, also should mention a lot of people say, what is Time? What does that mean? Originally, it stood for Teen Institute for Missionary Evangelism. And, uh, and then there were more people than just teenagers coming, so they changed it to the Institute for Missionary Evangelism. And nowadays we just refer to it as, as Time Ministries. And our main purpose, as should be the purpose of any ministry that anybody does, is to glorify God. Right? How do we do that? How does our ministry do that? Well, Time glorifies God by leading groups to the mission field, short-term groups to the mission field, to serve local churches. And I know a lot of, there, there was a book out recently called When Helping Hurts that, that wasn't too kind to short-term missions, uh, feeling as though it's probably better just to send money uh, to those folks to let them do the work and provide the income and so forth. But our founders, our founders, Zero and Loretta Brown, had, a, had a, a key purpose in that they wanted to expose people like you and me to missions, to missions life. Where do new missionaries come from? Where are they going to come from? Well, if you've never gone and served or never been exposed to it, it's a little harder to, to make that decision or to see where God has given you a, a skill set or a talent. And so one of their, their founding uh, principles was to expose groups to short-term missions and also to help the national or the local church. So that's, uh, that's what we do. There are three main ways that we do this. We do this through construction, and as Pastor Chris mentioned, one of our, our primary projects is the building of chapels, small churches for pastors that are just getting started. 
and in the hopes that these churches will grow and eventually be able to build a, a, a concrete building, a more significant structure. And we visited one of those just a few weeks ago. Also, benches are a construction project that, uh, that people do. And again, our founders, they wanted projects that anybody could participate in. So as the group that came down from Glory Baptist, you guys were not all contractors. And you <laughs> certainly were able to make those benches. The chapels are the same or, or the same way. So it's a, it's a ministry that anybody can participate in, uh, no matter what experience you have. And if construction is not your thing, the second thing that we do is evangelistic outreach. Primarily, we are there to share the gospel and help those pastors in their community share the gospel. And so we have a lot of different evangelistic outreach tools, whether it's VBS programs, just like you might have here during the summer. Um, we have a sports ministry program. We have a women's ministry. Uh, we've done medical clinics and eyeglass clinics. But through all of those, we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and helping those pastors who, again, may not have the resources to do that uh, on, on their own. And then the third component, component of our ministry is discipleship. And normally, you guys as a group coming down don't get to see that. But if you come several times, you will see the results of that discipleship. Because we have a number of volunteers that serve with us, uh, college students during the summertime, volunteers, local Dominican volunteers. And we are working with them, discipling them to become missionaries as well. Uh, this photo is, is uh, a couple of years old, but three of those folks, well, all four of them now are full-time missionaries with time. There are two Americans, two Dominicans, and three of those, uh, of those individuals are married as well, and their spouses are interested in being full-time missionaries with time, too. So discipleship takes, takes a little bit longer, but it's how we grow and how the, the mission continues. This is uh, our DR team. Uh, our founder, Doretta Brown, is still with us at 98 years old. She, she serves a little less actively than she did, but she came down a couple of times during this past year. Uh, last we heard, she was baking peach pies, so she is, she is up and at them. And uh, although she has said she's ready to go home, she's ready, uh, ready to join her husband in, in, in eternity, but she is still such a blessing to us and such a legacy and such a, uh, a wealth of, of, of information and, uh, and guidance and wisdom as, as, we continue, uh, as we continue our ministry. All right, so today what we'd like to talk a little bit, bit about is the loaves and the fishes, right? Um, hopefully you remember the story of, of the loaves and the fishes. And it comes from Luke, or from Mark, excuse me, from Mark chapter 6. And we're going to take a look at verses 45 through 52. And I'm going to let Cindy share a little bit about this. Oh, by the way, I do want to say this is our first presentation, our very first presentation uh, during our home assignment. So you guys are our guinea pigs. Uh, pray for a little bit of grace. And constructive, constructive criticism afterwards is always welcome as we kind of work out the bugs of, uh, of presenting uh, some of the material. Give her the red mic, please. Give her the red mic. Uh, does it match her outfit? Oh, yeah. There we go. Uh, so, yes, we are going to talk about the loaves and the fishes. But first, we're actually going to look at what happened after the loaves and the fishes. And so that may be um, in, these, in this scripture, in Mark 6, 45 through 52. So this is actually when Jesus walks on the water. And it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, where he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountain to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake. And he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, 
because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. And we want to start with a storm in this, because if we see, even if we start in verse 25, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. He knew what was about to happen. And we knew, as we were getting you guys, the glory crew, onto the airplane, God knew what was about to happen. He knew COVID was coming. It was already in China, really. It was already in East Asia. So God knew what was about to happen. And just as they were getting on the plane, um, as a family, we were about to move. Um, as you saw those pictures of uh, three of the missionaries, um, well, actually four of them, all of them were coming onto the field. And the apartment that we lived in, in the Time Center, was made for new missionaries. Well, in the first 10 years, there hadn't been any new missionaries at all. And so the, you know, even the board had to kind of remind us and go, um, don't you guys remember that apartment was for the new missionaries? So, yeah, you're right. And we've got four new missionaries coming onto the onto the field, and one, two being American, two being Dominican, and we needed to work out some housing situations for them. So we were in the process of moving. So we were packing up our stuff, um, and those of you that maybe have lived in a home for an extended period of time, your children grew up there. I remember you know, putting Paul and Sophie to bed there. It was a little hard. We've lived there for 10 years. And, and so it was a troubling storm, even internally, as we began to pack and go through things. And so at the end of February, we moved. And, to, and so just in that time, we're trying to get a dining room table, trying to get their bedroom set up, trying to get it situated. And then, March 18th hits. School's canceled. We are all in, we are all in quarantine. Now, to draw a little bit of a picture of Dominican quarantine, um, a state of emergency was declared. Uh, you could only be out from 5 a.m. in the morning till 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. And that was it. You had to be off the streets by 5 p.m. unless you had a authorization that you were police or you were medical officials or you had something to do with selling food or working in a grocery store or you had to have a special permission. So that meant um, virtual schooling. Um, it was not as, the school definitely in the second year did a lot better and invested quite a bit in virtual schooling. Um, but it was a little rough, lots of tears. Um, but our kids were both very resilient. It was finding new ways for them to play. Um, we couldn't take them out. Kids were not allowed to go anywhere. They weren't allowed to go to the stores or go out in public. So um, the place where our, new, our apartment was also new, they were building. So they had these huge sand piles. So we remember almost every afternoon at about 5 o'clock just to get outside of the house, we would go to the sand piles and play. But also the storm being there were pastors without chapels. March, we were supposed to have over 80 people in our ministry just in March of 2020 alone. All of that was canceled. And this foundation you see laid dormant um, as of March 2020. Uh, next slide. And so what we want to 
focus on today, and that is why we want to focus on the loaves and the fishes, is if we look at these verses 51 through 52, immediately he spoke to them. And he says, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then Jesus climbs into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves their hearts were hardened. And so we wonder why, how could the disciples have forgotten about the loaves and the fishes? And I'm going to have Chris share on this, because these disciples had just seen an incredible miracle being the loaves and the fishes. And the same for us. We had seen God provide an apartment. Um, we had seen him um, continue to supply our need. Um, we got everything we needed for that apartment and to live comfortably. And we began to wonder what our hearts hardened. But I think we can learn from the disciples and what they saw and what happened in that story of the loaves and the fishes. So if we read in, in Mark chapter 6, starting in, uh, in verse 34, it says, He went ashore, and he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five, and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups of green grass. They sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up the twelve baskets full of broken pieces and fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. And the total is actually probably more over 10,000, including, including women and children. So very, very interesting, this experience they, they had. And even at the point where, where they had said, you know, what, where are we supposed to get food for these people? We don't, we don't have that kind of money. Even at this point, they had forgotten what had just happened before. If you read just before this passage, it was when Jesus sent out the, uh, the disciples. And he gave them the power, the power to heal people and to cast out demons. And they had even forgotten that. Just in this, in this brief period of time. So, why? Why were their hearts hardened? Why did they forget? And so as Chris mentioned, if we look at verses 37 and 38, Jesus answered, but you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that would take more than half a year's wage. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And they said, how many loaves do you have? And he asked them, go and see. And so before I went to the field, and kind of as Chris was mentioning, I was a, I was a teacher. And so I was like, visuals and using visuals because they really give, you know, they're kind of great toys, but um, the idea being, and this is the same thing for us, we thought we had limited resources. And so did they. They go, you want us to go and pay? And they go, if we're going to feed this many people, that's going to take a half a year's wages. And it's just bread and fish. And then they had limited expectations because they just thought, well, we don't have the money, maybe you do. And they thought, Jesus also, the hard thing in looking at the Gospels, a key thing for all the disciples is they were looking for a king. 
they thought Jesus was the king. And when he wasn't, the king they thought he was. And that he thought their hearts weren't in the right place. So then the storm came after. So even looking at the loaves and fishes, we, in the midst of our um, quarantine, and in, in the middle of what were we going to do, um, we saw, we thought, oh, this will just be two weeks, right? We all thought, this will just be two Why weeks. Right, exactly. And when it kept going, it kept going. And our summer groups canceled. And then it became evident it was worldwide. We couldn't travel. We couldn't come to the States. We started thinking of our limited resources, limited expectations, and limited view of God. But then, God met us in the storm. Amen. Amen. Yes, because our ministry traditionally has been dependent on groups and on the teams from the states to come down. They provide the resources. They build the chapels. They do the ministry. Right? Without you, we can't do anything. Right? Or so we thought. Mm -hmm. That was the box that we put God in. So what happened? New opportunities. We knew that groups were probably not going to come for the foreseeable future. We had seen a similar situation happen to our sister side in Mexico way back in 2010 when the violence broke out and the swine flu broke out. Um, they canceled all of their teams. And even to this day, slowly they are still trying to recover from that because when, when this stuff hits CNN or Fox News, it doesn't matter which one to watch, right? How many of you are willing to jump on a plane and go to Haiti right now? Right? <laughs> Yet they still have needs too. Right? They surely need the gospel as much as anyone. So we had to come up with some and think of some new opportunities and seek the Lord's guidance. What do you want us to do? These things that we have never done before. Well, one of our one of our missionaries, his name is Noe, he's the big guy. Um, and uh, he's a Dominican. He's been with the ministry ever since it got started. He is our, our pastor connection. So he goes out and visits the various Dominican pastors and finds out what they need, where the chapels are going to be, and so forth. And he was talking to some of these pastors, and they were saying, well, you know, the members of our congregation are losing their jobs. They, they, they can't go out. Their businesses are closing. They can't sell food on the streets anymore. And they're having a very difficult time supporting their families. So we started to pray about that, and we, and we thought, well, we as missionaries are all still in the country, and we still have connections. Even though people cannot come, they can send resources, and maybe we can help some of these families, of these, of these uh, pastors. And so we came up with this program called Time to Eat. It's time to eat. And for $77, we were able to put together food bags, two food bags that, that consisted of milk, uh, dry, uh, rice, um, pasta, beans, um, Cereal. cereals, Oatmeal. Um, several, yeah. several things. And it would feed a family of six for a week. A family of six for a week. And between our, our Dominican location and our Mexico site, by the end of 2020, this was, uh, we started doing this in, in the middle of summer. Our target was 20,000 meals by the end of the year. By about September or October, we had surpassed that already. And by year's end, I believe it exceeded 30,000 meals, 30,000 meals. So that was a ministry, food distribution, that we never would have ever thought about getting involved in. And there was a need, there was a time and a place, and the Holy Spirit helped us with, with this program, helped us to meet some of those desperate needs 
at the moment. Now, the program is still going on. Of course, the economy there is somewhat improving as it, as it has here. Some people are getting back to work, but there is still a need. So um, if people would like to participate in that, they can make donations directly to our, to our website, and we can continue to distribute those. I, I wanted to mention this picture. I, I chose this picture on purpose. This was one of the churches, one of the chapels that we visited. Uh, these bags were about 40 pounds apiece. And here she is. She just lifted it up, put it on her head, and, and off she went down the street. We have some other photos of motorcycles, you know, people on motorcycles with these big bags. So they may do getting them, uh, getting them to their home. Another program. We're also hoping to raise more for this, yes. uh, for Time to Eat, because it supports the next ministry um, so that we can help national pastors through 100 stories. So this was an, another program, another campaign that, uh, that we started. As, uh, as Chris had mentioned before, uh, earlier on, the chapels that we have built in the Dominican Republic, uh, we estimate that since 1992 when the ministry started, uh, by God's grace, we've been able to provide over 400 churches for pastors around the island, and about four or five in, in Haiti. And many of those churches we never visit again after we build them, especially if they're far away. We don't visit them, so we don't know uh, how they're doing. Uh, have they survived? Are they still serving their community? Is the pastor still there? And so we started this campaign called 100 Stories to, to start answering some of those questions and to see how we can continue to partner with them in the future. Normally, these churches, these chapels, uh, they are not run by time ministries. We don't establish those churches. Uh, we provide them the resources to get started, and then and then we step away. And so we we started to follow up with, with these with these churches, and our target is a it is a hundred stories. Right now we're on number thirty eight, I, I believe, is the most recent one. Um, and and we do get a few stories out of each one. So the actual number of chapels we we follow up with is is in the mid twenties or so. But so far, all with the exception of one, all of those churches are still functioning and still serving their communities. They may have different, different pastors. Um, they may have expanded the church. They may have started to build a block or concrete structure. But they are still serving the gospel with their communities and, and providing a, a much needed resource. And this particular picture here was the one that Pastor Chris was mentioning. Pastor Ben Cosme, Francisco Ben Cosme. Uh, a group from Hope College out of, out of Holland, Michigan, built the chapel uh, a few years ago. And then uh, you guys as a church came down and built some of the benches for that community. So please go to our, our Facebook page or our Time Ministries YouTube. You can see all these different stories. And, and we still have quite a few more to go. But it is a blessing connecting with them, finding out what their needs are. These are places that in the future perhaps we can do VBS for. Uh, we can help them with other projects. Uh, uh, Pastor Francisco was asking about medical clinics. Could we come out and do medical clinics for, for that community? And so 100 Stories was really a great opportunity that we probably wouldn't have even, even thought of. And the other thing that this does is that it helps us to evaluate our ministry. Because for some time we, we would say, well, does the chapel building really work? Is it really effective? Does it, does it help? And, and each one of these stories, each one of these visits that we make solidifies that, um, that yes, these are working, this is an effective ministry, and there's still a waiting list. There's always a waiting list for these churches. The only thing that, well, correction, the only thing that used to limit us was you, okay? People coming down, groups coming down to build them, right? As I mentioned. We don't have groups, we can't build chapels, right? Not now. Not now. So, as we talked about, the limited resources, limited expectations, and limited view of God that we had, God said, uh-uh, hold on. So, we, um, so as I mentioned, all of our summer groups of 2020 canceled. But, they, there were two major groups that donated their money. One is the young girl on uh, Soka Finside, 
of the picture. Her name is Hadassah Lewis. She lives in North Carolina. She goes to a church called Southbrook Church. And her passion for Christ and for God has grown immensely as her family has come down at least three times, if not four. And what she asked for us um, the last time Chris and I visited her was, is there anything I could do for time? Because I have to do a school project for my, for my Christian school. And I would like to help Time Ministries. So we gave her a few ideas and like chapels and benches. We said, well, there's kind of one we, that's been moving in our hearts. And that is the youth of the Dominican Republic. And to partner with a Christian school. We would love to give a group of um, Dominican youth from a Christian school or any Dominican youth around 15 to 20 a time experience, a week with time. And we thought, well, that's going to be about three to five thousand dollars. She goes, got it. I'm going to do it. So she did a 5K run. That 5K run was supposed to be March 2020. The 5K run did not happen. But she raised over $2,500 for those students. So those, that money was sent to Time Ministries for those students. The chapel money from another Christian school out of Florida saved their money. And we shared with them this project. And they said, we wanted to go to that. So for one year, those funds were guarded and saved with time. Last, so it would be, well, okay, sorry. So 2021. So school year 2020, 2021, um, Christian school where my, for our children go, um, invested highly in a online platform, continued to do online schooling, um, continued to do the same programs. In early of this year, 2021, the counselor for the senior class came to us and said, is there anything our students could do with you? Anything. And we said, well, Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And because, yes, they wanted, typically they would take their group on a mission trip uh, to an orphanage, but because of COVID, that orphanage was closed. Uh, that class for that year is that maybe if there are any, any seniors from that period of time, you know, all those fun events were canceled, things like prom and, and graduation and so forth. Um, and so we said, we're here, we're open, we've got chapels, and graciously, two different groups have donated their funds. And so you can have missions experience just like any other group. Now, because of COVID, they did not stay with us overnight. They would go back to their homes each night. But they were able to provide a chapel for a pastor who still had a need. And, and again, this was a passion of our founders was that it wasn't Americans coming down and running churches or establishing churches. Their passion was to train up the nationals to do that. Because who better than someone in their own language, in their own culture, to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And as we talked about earlier, uh, growing the next generation of missionaries, what better than to have Dominicans as missionaries? And so these students, these students all got exposed to uh, missions in their own country. And we're hoping for that to continue. And in fact, uh, throughout the course of the year, there were, there were three chapels done like this by local Dominican groups. Even though we couldn't have groups come down from the US, um, in, in one case, the school that Cindy mentioned, they built the chapel. Uh, in another case, another Dominican church raised funds to build a chapel for a church plant they were establishing out in the, out of the country. And then in the third case, we had a chapel that again was a vision from our pastors. Remember I mentioned about um, them having a chapel for a few years and then having a, a concrete block building. And the idea was to take that chapel then and move it someplace else and give it to another pastor in need. So this, this chapel that you see in the upper right uh, was a chapel that had been taken down from one, one location, 
again, pre-COVID, and we just happened to have all those pieces lying around at our, at our location. Um, and us as a time team, as our time missionaries, went out and did that chapel for the week. So again, changing our ideas of we only do chapels with, and even our, our president of time ministries, I thought, well, no, all the, all the Americans do chapels. Only they come down and do the chapels. Well, no. This, the, the need is still there. The pastors are still in need. And slowly changing our mindset, unhardening our hearts to what we thought was the plan, softening our hearts, taking God out of that box that we put him in, and seeing how we can continue to do ministry, even though it may not look exactly the same as it did before. And even as we speak, this week, a Dominican church is going to be building a chapel for a group of Americans that had to cancel because of COVID. We were to have a group of 30 this past summer from Oklahoma. And just before they came, uh, five people in the group came down with COVID, and then later it spread throughout the group, and so they canceled. And now this Dominican church is going to build it this next week and start building the pieces. And so we are just amazed to go back to remembering the loaves and fishes that if we do not put God in a box, we don't think of our limited resources, our limited expectations, or limited God, He can use it. And He can use it for amazing ways so that the gospel continues. And what we want to say is thank you. We want to say thank you, Lori. Um, every single one of you are part of this. Your prayers, your passion, your support is part of our team. So we want to say thank you. We also want to welcome you to our team. That's how we consider you part of our team. We could not be there without you. And so the more we can visit you, the more we can get to know you, that is really a passion and part of our hearts. So welcome to the team, and please help us not to forget the loaves and the fishes. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather first to worship you and to glorify you. And may we do that in all of the things uh, that we do, uh, whether we're students, whether we're, whether we're teachers, whether we're um, mothers and fathers and, and, and so forth and family. Uh, help us to take you out of that box that we have put you in. The preconceived ideas we have about what you will do, what you can do. Uh, Lord, help us to expect great things, to expect big things, and to not be like the disciples, fearful and uh, afraid. We thank you for, for this wonderful family here at Glory Baptist. Pray that you would continue to bless each and every one of them. And Lord, if it is a stirring uh, in your heart uh, to come and to serve, uh, as, as Roy thinks about coming and serving this summer, or this, uh, sorry, this spring, maybe this summer, we'll see, <laughs> for the spring, uh, Lord, the help and the talents that you have given each and every person here can be used by you in your kingdom. Uh, we may all, not all be preachers, we may not all be music, musicians and singers, uh, but you have given us something um, that we can use to glorify you. Help us to do that, whether it's here, uh, within the church, within our family, schools, or workplaces, or whether it's on the other side of the world, uh, that we can be your hands and feet. So we thank you, Lord, for this day ask all this in your son's precious and glorious name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's all Spanish I'll speak. But you got to work on your Spanish. Our, 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 our pastor down there says that um, English is the language of business. Right? French is the language of love. But in heaven, we're all going to speak Spanish. So start working on it.
Let's give, let's give them a round of applause.